Warning. The Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough, coming to you from Crew West Studio in Los Angeles. Man, do we have a cool program for you all today. I have no doubt you will learn, grow, and be inspired by today's show. Before we get into our main event, I want to thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode and subscribe. Your likes and follows help ensure you won't miss any of our new shows, and it makes the algorithm gods happy, which helps us. So thanks for that. Also, be sure to visit our website, notrealart.com. Sign up for our newsletter to keep your finger on the pulse of everything we're doing here at Not Real Art for artists and art lovers. A lot of great stuff there. On the website, you'll see you'll get uh, free educational videos. You can sign up for our artist grant for the chance to receive two thousand dollars. Can buy affordable original and contemporary art through our partnership with Sugar Press. And you can become a supporter through Patreon if you want. So be sure to check out our website today for all the good, healthy stuff we got for you. Okay, art lovers. Today we have John Chang. John is one of our 2021 Not Real Art Grant winners. John is a Chinese-American artist, immigrated here from Shanghai. I think he said 1982. You'll hear about it in the interview. Just a wonderful human being. Considers himself a spiritual escapist. And we talk about that, but John's work is deep and rich and powerful layers on top of layers on top of layers of meaning and thought and intention. John is one of our winners, one of our six 2021 Not Real Art Grant winners. We are thrilled to have him as part of the Not Real Art family. I so enjoyed our conversation from his studio late one night, not too long ago. So without further ado, let's get into this and hear from the one and only John Chang. John Chang, Johnny Chang, JC. Hi. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. I'm so happy to meet you and see you face to face here over the internet as we record this. Congratulations on being one of our 2021 Not Real Art Grant recipients. Thank you so much for having me. And I was so excited. I'm looking forward to do what I do. Well, it is uh, an honor to have you. Tell you what, we are so grateful for you and the work that you do. Finding you was a gift to us. The fact that you are one of the six winners is a is a testament to you because quite frankly, we had 827 artists that applied for the really? grant. Yes, yes. Wow, that's amazing. It was an incredible group of artists, and so, I'm so lucky. yes, well, it's you know you deserve it, and we're we're lucky to have you. So welcome and congratulations. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. I'm are you so lucky? Have you applied for many grants? Have you won many grants? I won some grant, like a residency grant, just a small grant. Mm-hmm. Um, one for Vermont and one for uh, Vermont Studio Center and one from Wyoming, I think it's called. I forgot the name. Forgot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, there will yeah, not be a test. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while, so. Sure, sure. Now, where are you right now? Are you in your studio in Pasadena? Are you, where yeah. do you live? Yep. Yeah, I kind of live on both sides, between San Diego and LA. I have a two studio working back and forth, sometimes working in LA because, you know, you got a project to do. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I'm a commercial by day and the painter by night. So I kind of take a, take a project when I slow down either my project or my art. So I'm kind of back and forth doing both works. 
So just to be clear, I want to make sure I understood what you said. So you're a commercial artist by day and then a fine artist by night. Is that what That's I understood? Correct. All That's right. Correct. All right. <laughs> well, one of them, one of them pays the bills. Exactly. Uh, I'm guessing it's the one that has the commercial in, word in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> I use my skill. Yes. To, you know. Yes. <laughs> Well, at the end of the day, right? Yeah. You're a communicator, artist. Yeah. There's great demand for good communicators out there in the world. What kind of uh, work do you do in commercial art? I'm doing high-end uh, digital uh, storyboard sketching mm-hmm. and manipulation and also and retouching composition. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's kind of for, for the movie industry. You yes. Know, like movie banner, poster. Sure, sure. It's kind of a, if you get the project to do. It's kind of an intense work. Well, Photoshop is no joke, man. I mean, if you really know how to work Photoshop or some of these programs, I mean, it is, they're magic makers. It's what you can do. Yes. It's magical. Yes. Also, that's the new tool that we have to embrace. As an artist, we we always think about physicality. We want to, you know, to be like to use my hand dirty and working in the studio. But at the same time, you have to embrace the new tool. The tool is shape your and it'll push you like the new digital age. So it's a new task. The task of the searching for the new meanings in the new world. That's what I thought. Why do you think artists, uh, traditional artists who perhaps went to art school to study painting or sculpture, to the extent that some of those artists have had difficulty embracing the digital medium? What do you think about the digital medium is challenging for them? And why do you think there's a resistance there sometimes? I think that's for me, it's still the same. As an artist, I still kind of reject, resist all the digital. I always liked the pencil, the, the ink, the pen. There is a limitation. You have to know what you do. Use a hand. But the digital, I think it's more easy if you something wrong, so you can go back, you can read, you can repeat. <laughs> so mentality, a lot of artists do reject that. That's, it's too fast. You have to practice, which is short of time. It's a lot of artists. I, I met a lot of artists in, in Disney Studio. Most of the storyboard artists, they, they, just, <laughs> they just say, hey, I, if you want me to do the... <laughs> Why I can't tap it, you know, to Joel, I'm going to quit. But I don't know. It's, it's hard for people. Um, I think it's good at drawing and they jump to the next things, right? So humans, it's kind of always a hesitate to take, take on for something that's you never see or no experience. You kind of wonder around, try to see people's doing and you kind of yeah, I can do it. Yes. Well, after 10, 20, 30,000 hours of of work in a medium, whether it's paint or or illustration, what have you, you've worked years and years and years to perfect your craft. And then along comes a kid with a computer and says, oh, I can do that. There's a bit of a tension there, right? <laughs> like nobody is. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a struggle. But yeah, it's like an offen- think- it's an off- it's offensive. It's like, you know, how yes, dare you? Yes. I spend a lot of money and a lot of my energy on my hand paints. And all of a sudden you can just jump into the digital tour. But I, at the same time, you think the digital, the Photoshop, you still need to craft so many years to be a top to be like, what do you do in the art world? I think it's the same thing. They, they also have a common ground. Yes. They have the same, same thing. Everybody think it's so easy. Photoshop, you just one click and you have a bevel and one click, you have a shadow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's like anything else, I guess, right? Like when, if you really choose to go deep on something and become proficient and become an expert, you start to realize, and as an artist, right, if, if you're trying to say something new and something that's not been said before, then you need to kind of learn the history of that tool. You have to really learn every dimension of that tool. And then you get to say something, yeah. you know, new and fresh. Right? Absolutely. It's all you have to fundamental skill. 
you have to experience about the fine art once you jump into the, the Photoshop, whatever, the computer art. You have to experience, you have the basic skill from, you know, like a perspective, a light source, all kinds of things. It's also help you to produce computer work at the same time. Not you are more professional to break the boundary to push your computer art. Yes. How many hours a day do you spend on the computer? You think it depends on the project, mm-hmm. but I kind of a four or five hours, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the four or five hour in the <laughs> computer, and the four or five hour in the studio doing all the cutting, pasting, painting, writing, all my. Collecting, cutting, clipping, all the <laughs> things. It's a long journey. It's a long processing. I kind of enjoy to sometimes when I go into my studio, I just, you don't want to paint and you just sit there and you just think and you just listen to music and then you kind of a, and it push you back, kind of a balance both sides. It's all kind of a, you are busy life, a chaotic environment and doing all the clients, it's just, you know, <laughs> to push you and then you go back to your studio and you say, hey, I'm in charge. I want to be the boss. I do what I like to do. I express myself. So do you uh, forget to eat? <laughs> yeah, you know, because I know I know some artists they go into their studios and they come out hours later starving because they forgot to eat. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Don't. Good. It's a- not a good thing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, glad the answer is yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. So you're in LA now, but you're, you're sort of based out of San, uh, San Diego as well. I, I don't think I really knew that. When do you go to San Diego versus LA? I guess your entertainment work is mostly based in LA and you go to San Diego when and for what? When I get the project, when I have a painting, I think I should just get away and I, I think it's more quiet. It's, yes. The cities and yes. uh, because I have a lot of artist friends, the community, you, yes. you get to yes. talk to the people and to communicate and to see people's mm-hmm. works. Mm-hmm. And uh, LA is the same thing. Or it used to be always you just go to the you know, city or the, you know, the art district to see the art. But now it's kind of like just stay home. For, yeah. It's almost like two years. <laughs> I know. I'm it's so, flying. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like crazy. And during that time, and a lot of things you want to buy, starting last year, I think around March or March or April, and you stay home and you try to get some older, some your art materials. And it's just hard to get your order on time. It's all delayed. Stores closed. And I kind of realized that moment. I just went around my studio and my house and think what I can do. And all of a sudden, I found the shipping box. I have so many holding the shipping box in the basement. So I grab all the shipping box and it just unfold and it's cut. And they use my the recent project I call. I'm still working on, still, you know, continue my process called object reimagination. Mm-hmm. And I just cut all kinds of a cardboard and shipping box in shape, like people's face, and I glue them together and kind of a 3D, 2D, 3D look. That's my new project for the next year's exhibition in one of the gallery. Mm. I think it's a very, very interesting location is it tusa missouri tusa missouri to it's a tusa is it i forgot the name but it is it's it's in missouri i think it's in missouri or well there's tucson arizona uh, tucson's arizona but you're saying missouri yeah whatever it's not important. it doesn't matter to, yeah, yeah just, <laughs> okay. you know just a piece i'm still to produce mm-hmm. during that time mm-hmm. pandemic mm-hmm. and all the black lives matters and all the lives matters, anti-black, anti-Asian. It's just chaotic that moment. So I cutting all the shape of a face from you can just randomly kind of a things I'm doing right now. It's kind of fun. 
it's a, a little intense, but at the same time, you just think, oh, the country, what's going on? And it's just, it's sometimes just sad. As an artist, I think we should get together as a one person to express, communicate to your community, to let people know, hey, we all love each other. We all can just talk to each other. We can just talk to understand each other. That moment, I kind of just, uh, what I can do, just express yourself, do some hard work to let people to see it. I think you have the same feeling. Yes. The power of art to facilitate more empathy in the world, the power of art to shine a light on our common humanity. This is the power of art and the responsibility that we have as artists and art advocates because we are all human beings. And why we find it so hard to see our common humanity. It's a baffling riddle for me. It has to be addressed. And if artists and art can help to shine a light on what we have in common, hopefully that will serve to build empathy and understanding. Exactly. Yes. I think artists should just get out there, just throw some art, let people to see let people to make their own interpretation how your art can be a part of your meaning or you can just give some sense and message. That's my special project for the event. So I have a doing my basic painting, you know, just general painting. It's a continuous. I used to collect all the newspapers. LA City is big. They have so many foreign language newspapers I collect I clipping it and because you can read some kind of a translation it's a so funny so not <laughs> not exactly the meaning they kind of a translate some from LA Times and you look at oh it's not really quite right so you kind of a put together you know you can arrange and range those texts and you put together it's kind of a city, all the people who live in the city. It's the information that you, you read every day in your life. So collect those things. And also, at the same time, you, you go around the city and you took photos. And also your photos inspire your works. All the graffiti, all the you know, dirty alleys and stuff, kind of stuff. And you bring those things. It, it's kind of you collect those things and you clutch and you use a glue and clutch a lot of on your panels and then you look at you're writing some of your calligraphy and you you kind of uh oh, next day and you just stand it you say oh it's not that good you can rearrange it's just your life and you wrench and wrench and then you and next day you send it and then you go back and you see something some information it's there and some it's gone it reminds you, and it's kind of a like memories, and you, you see it. It's not exactly hundred percent there, but it brings some kind of a memory. I did one piece with oh, it's my friend. We collaborate each other, and we collect a lot of a uh, newspaper post production material things. And one day, about two years ago, she passed away. Mm. And I go back to the studio and look at those paintings. You see, and then you find those images, the text. We work together. It brings some kind of a memory. That's so warm, kind of a, oh, so we still have some kind of a, the meaning things in, in back in your painting. And also, it's kind of a, my childhood memory. When I grew up, I started piano at first, but eventually it took up a drawing with my uncle and you went to the the city back in China there's a lot of a big character poster black and white during the chaotic times cultural revolution you know the US that's why I inspire for those kind of things and bring to my paintings so that's my I think it's my good resource for my paintings so 
I'm still doing that. It's a uh, labor intense keeping. But recently, all the print material is getting less and less. It's all digital. The only things get more is people shopping online. So you get a lot of、uh, box. I think the box also kind of represents personal identity, and what you buy, what what you like, it's also kind of <laughs> represent you. So I cut all the text from all the boxes. So I collect all kinds of in color and black and white in the color. So I, just to, to see how things go. Your work is very labor intensive, isn't it? Exactly, a lot of time consuming. But it's fun, and the times are like a fly. And once you're doing work at the studio, how old were you when you started drawing with your uncle? Around eight, ten. So I got into drawing because I was very shy and was a bully in the school, the whole school, like to the high school. So I kind of just hey, I can just join without breaking and keep drawing. So it's so fun. Was your uncle an artist? My uncle is a it's a well known painter and comic book artist. Oh really? Is he here in the states or is he back in China? He's in Australia. In Australia. I miss him. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. When did you immigrate to the U.S. from Shanghai? Nineteen ninety two. Nineteen ninety two. Okay. How old were you at that time? Twenty twenty nine. Okay, so at twenty nine. I mean, how were you feeling about immigrating to the United States? I mean, were you I, excited? <laughs> were you were you excited? Were you scared? I can only imagine that you know, if I was trying to immigrate to Shanghai or to China, I would be excited. I would be scared. I would be so all of these things. How were you feeling at that time? I was I was so exciting and scary at the same time.、Mm. I graduated from the art school up there. I said,、like, "Oh, I got a chance to go to." American. I want to learn the contemporary art, but after all that, it's just a struggle. Artist,、mm. it's everything is different, and it's the culture shock for me.、Mm. Back at that time, China was so poor. Thirty、mm-hmm. years ago,、mm. it's it's like you only see it's from the movie, the Hollywood movie. The Hollywood movie, it's all like oh. Beautiful house, backyard, front yard, nice street, so quiet. But here, oh, it's all different. You have to start from yourself. Even your relative, just hey, welcome to America. It's all yours. No one gonna help you. So that's right. <laughs> the first stop、uh, <laughs> is at San Diego、mm. because my parents is lives there. So I stay there for a few months and moved to. I got a chance to. Work with the gallery on Jacande, so I moved there.、Uh, man, just a story. It's a long story. I just short, and I got ripped off by the gallery. Oh no! I worked with the gallery for a year, and all of a sudden, I went to the gallery and say, "Hey, I want to get my check and to see how it's going." And the gallery is just closed. The signs outside say, "Hey, no longer." <laughs> A gallery out of business. Out of business. My art is gone. Oh my god! I got uh, uh, there's a there, there's a, about three, four, five artists stand outside. Say, hey, what are we gonna do? Oh my god! So <laughs> so heartbreaking. Say, oh, that's a that's a big shock for me. Say, oh. Well, welcome to America, right? <laughs> yeah, people say, hey, welcome. I say, oh, that's interesting. So at that moment, I realized I should find a job first and get on track and just to get back to the normal. So I end up to LA. I just bring full on my portfolio with seventy five dollar in my pocket, and、I、say, "Hey, I, LA, I have to make it. Otherwise, I'm gonna go back to China." <laughs> So at that moment, I'm so lucky that I met a lot of people and helped me through. You know that moment, sleeping in the car, I being a bus boy, you name it. All the experience become a good resource.、Mm. 
it's push you know it's a good in, in my future art mm. oh i can't you know walk that far it's all about all the people's here all the people's help do you remember the first friend you had in la oh yeah it's my boss yeah I got an interview with my boss. I got a portfolio and a seventy-five dollar. I went to the shop. The mm. shop's doing all the crafted pink hand pink T-shirt. That mm. time so mm. popular. He took a look at my portfolio. Said, "Oh, you got a skill, so no worry." So I said, "I don't have money." He said, oh, don't worry about it. I took you to see any place that you can. You can just rent a place. I said, "I don't have money." Oh, he said, oh, <laughs> you are. <laughs> and he just said, oh, if you don't buy, you can just sleep in my car. Once you get the pay from me, so you can, we can help you to find a place to live. Wow. Yeah, he saved me. Wow. I just, oh, so hey, the war, there's a lot of good people. There is. And, of course, yeah. But the immigrant story... F- I'm born and raised here. I've never immigrated to another country with another language. I have several friends who have immigrated Mm -hmm. here from either China or India or Africa or Mm -hmm. South America. And I have nothing but mad respect and love for our immigrant brothers and sisters who come here looking for a better life and get so frustrated when our country doesn't figure out how to create a a humane, rational approach that really works at scale, (laughs) right? (laughs) For immigrants, because most Americans could not immigrate to China successfully. Most Americans could not immigrate to Africa successfully, (laughs) you know, to, to, to go, to go to another country, learn another language with $75 in your pocket. (laughs) I think they can, I think you guys can do it. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm, gl- I'm glad you think so. I'm glad you think so. So in your statement, you consider, you say you consider yourself a spiritual escapist. Exactly. I educate in China. My undergrad came here. I went to Boston for my grad school. I kind of have both educate. At the same time, and you revisit back to China. They thought you're American because you educate in America. You are not no more organic anymore. But at the same time, you are here. No one say you are. You always like, oh, you're Chinese. You're Chinese, obviously. You kind of uh, don't belong to each side. At the same time, for me, I think I don't relate to each other. At the same time, I connect to both. I have everything. So that's why I think I, I always call myself I like, cultural homeless, international homeless people. Mm. So because I live in the car, so I that time I always thought, oh, man, I'm going to be like a street artist. So I call myself, I don't know, it's for me, I think I belong to both. I educate in both sides, so I have to both cultural and more experience in both sides. So what is your spiritual heritage? I'm more like the Buddhism. Buddhist, you know, yep. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a more like more calm, more like self meditate, talk to yourself. But I, I'm born with the, raised with the Christian family. My grandpa is a is a minister, is a priest. Mm-hmm. So back in China, so mm-hmm. does he have to practice his religion underground? Is he able to be public with his church? He has his own church, but when the Communist Party took over, so not anymore. Right. So was he, he's a minister, he was a minister. He just practiced himself at his home. Low, low key, yeah, low sort of key. secret. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, to what extent, and I'm guessing Taoism is now sort of not uh, practiced uh, openly. I mean, to what extent is... What? The Tao? Taoism? Tao? You mean Tao? Yeah. Oh, any religion you can practice now, it's all open. Now it's all open. It's all like freely you can go, you can do whatever you want. In China? In China. Oh, okay. People is always, you know, criticize. Not like our age. It's all, it's all like restrict. 
But now it's all open. Mm -hmm. You consider yourself a Buddhist now. You practice Buddhism? Yeah. My uncle would say, you don't have to go anywhere. You you don't have to go to the place to pray or do. You always just stay home. You Anywhere you can pray, you can just uh, talk to yourself, come and yes. just give self a dialogue to talk to yourself. Yes. That's what I'm, you know, practice. It's like an Asian, you, you're born with it. Mm. And I'm curious because your work to me has, has a real spirituality about it. And I wonder, obviously it comes from you, but I, it's just, you know, I wonder what it's, where that roots are and, and where that comes from deep inside. And it's interesting because of course, with your roots in Christianity, as well as being a Buddhist, I'm guessing those belief systems are informing your work, at least on a subconscious level. Exactly. And because like Chinese children had to memorize like a few thousand characters, the Chinese character in order to write and read. And my age, you have to learn how to calligraphy. So the calligraphy, the processing, the writing, it's all kind of meditate yourself. So you, you train, you learn. So it's kind of a part of the, your life. Yeah. I mean, it the practice of writing those thousands of characters perfectly and being able to do that, memorize them, do that with, you know, but doing it perfectly, I, I, <laughs> it is, it, I guess, on a certain level, it would have to become a meditation. Exactly. I think a, a, a for the typography, the same thing. Mm. But we, we don't learn anymore. We all computer. It's kind of a, we're using new tool to, you know, just crafting new things. So is it accurate to say that it's a dying tradition in China? No, I don't think so. Okay, good. Okay. And there is a, just a people still like to pursue, to learn, but in a different way. It's not just for the, the tool to writing. It's kind of a goal for like artistic design. They kind of learn things. I don't know. For the future, it's going to be less, less people to learn those things. It's not just a very easy, quick way to get to learn how to write the calligraphy. You have to practice so many, so many hours a day. How often do you go back? Oh, I haven't been back for a long time. Do you miss it? I miss it because I went back in 2008. Mm -hmm. I see my uh, grad school mentor, mm -hmm. who is Xu Bing, who lives in Brooklyn. But he got a position back to his academy, Central Academy of, of Fine Arts. He got a position as a vice president. So I have to go there to meet with him to see my works. And at the same time, I kind of make observation for how he processing his work, his project. So I went back to that time and to see how his work had. It's the same thing. It's a culture shock for me. I bet, right? You go back, yeah. it's a different oh, uh, place. It's a different place. It's so westernized. It's like, oh my God. I shouldn't go. I shouldn't go here. I should just stay there. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like a, so fast. The city is like nonstop. It's like a nonstop. Just every day you wake up, all the cities change. Mm. People are so motivated. Hey, we they are so so good in the future. Everybody, the young. The, they don't want to make money, want to make living better, you know, like better life. So that's that's kind of a, just motivate me to say, hey, that's the place I should go back to do my projects, more conceptual works. You get inspired for the whole cities. So I met a lot of people and a lot of gallery. Used to be no gallery, right? <laughs> but now there's so many galleries. Yes. A lot of a, a major gallery from New York. Mm -hmm. They have a second gallery there. Yeah. That's just crazy. And as I understand it, and I'm, I'm a neophyte at best, but the contemporary art in China is a very new thing, isn't it? And traditionally, isn't the tradition of, of, of art making or making art sort of deeply rooted in realism 
And this idea, a uh, more contemporary Western approach to making art is fairly new in China. Is that, would that be a fair statement? I think uh, at my age, the realism is most the dominant art mm. scene. It's all mm. like you have to be realism on how to paint. It's so like a photo realism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But after 2000, it's all like flooding to China. It's all like every young artist want to be like conceptual art, contemporary art, modern art. And they are so enthusiastic about new things and everything. So, but now it's all like new things. It's a new art, contemporary art. You don't even find any like realism art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now it's all like a contemporary art, abstract. And the number of galleries have just exploded uh, oh, over the yeah. last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good or bad at the same time. Yeah. It's, yeah. I remember reading a story a while, many years ago, about graffiti in China. Specifically, I think it was Shanghai. And the article was telling a story about how there were some graffiti writers in Shanghai, I think it was. And they were painting and making graffiti and murals and things. And the police officers would come and just watch them. <laughs> because there was no there was no context for this being it was so new and weird that no one thought oh this is vandalism or this is illegal whereas in the, in New York or in the states if a graffiti writer was doing something you know the cops would be on them right away <laughs> but that in China it was such a weird new thing idea and thing that they didn't even know what it was to react to it you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story. It is. It's a lot of things new. They probably saw that's uh, kind of a maybe. It's a kind of a job. Yeah. Doing. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. He's supposed yeah. to be doing this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now it's all all over the place. Graffiti art. They also they also provide some uh, the wall space to let people to just express themselves. Just do it. It's kind of a part of the city. People's. Mm. express themselves mm. yeah kind of, yeah i've only been to shanghai once and i guess i went in 2008 maybe 2009 and i remember having a conversation with this woman who was a singer incredibly talented singer and we were chatting and we were talking about all kinds of things and got into politics a little bit and she talked to me she said well America is too free, too much freedom in America. Too much freedom is bad. And it was so interesting because, you know, I hadn't really ever thought about it quite that way. And, you know, she <laughs> she actually made a pretty good argument. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know what? Yeah, maybe a little more restraint and constraint uh, might be a good thing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but the energy, the energy and the the vitality of Shanghai when I was there, I mean, it was electric. I mean, it was so exciting. And it seemed like people were thrilled with what was what was happening uh, but i guess they were also the younger folks who were benefiting from the development and the business and the growth exactly you're totally right i think it's a good time 2008 it's good it's a picking up it's it's a good relationship both sides you know mm. both countries so it's it's good it's a lot of people you know travel between and artists that they mm-hmm. you know to get together and collaborate, and also a lot of artists of um, Chinese artists went to went to New York. Mm-hmm. They spent about ten years there, and they moved back to China. They bring the idea, they bring the, the Western culture, the energy into the country to pick up our scene. It's the good time and. So, uh, like a lot of people, like uh, Ai Weiwei, mm. you know Ai Weiwei? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, he went to New York and uh, spent like, 10 more years there and uh, nothing happens. And uh, a few artists there, they just can't make it. They went back. At uh, that time, China just booming. So they got lucky. They inspired by the cities. They made it. It's like a beneficial both sides. The yeah. win-win situation. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a good time. And I don't know this moment. 
Yeah, it's it's changing, right? I mean, yeah, it's a weird moment. So, I happened to travel a lot in the '90s and mm-hmm. made it to Hong Kong. Nice place. Yeah, well, it was the year. It was the last year before the British were handing it back over to oh. the mainland, mm. and it was interesting because, of course, at that time, the hope and the thought was that China was not really gonna. The mainland was not going to to impose much of anything on Hong Kong. They were they talked about one country, two systems. And then of course we've seen how it's evolved and changed over the years. And now it seems to be the democratic nature of Hong Kong seems to be uh, changing a great deal. Do you have friends in Hong Kong? I have a cousin. Mm-hmm. I have a cousin, uncle. So they they used to live in Hong Kong, and I think they still lives there. It's a for normal people they. The first thing is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is never, for us in the mainland, never thought that they, they have a so political. So the people don't care about any political things. And they just, hey, we want to make money. And we just need to live a better life. At the moment, the young generation, they don't even can afford to live in, in Hong Kong. It's so expensive. You don't even can own the place high rent apartment. So I think this time, that's the major issues for the young people. They are so like so angry for the city controlled by just a few family. That's what I thought. But no one's talking about the real problem. You're not just... So you mentioned your cousin, but are your parents still with us? Do you have family back in the mainland? Like, where's your family in the world? You talked about your uncle in Australia and your cousin in Hong Kong. My parents are living in San Diego. In San Diego? Yeah, I have a relative still living in China. Mm-hmm. And they think that it's a pretty good life. Yeah, yeah. But your parents are here, so there's no pressure maybe to go back to see your mom and dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah, in San Diego. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Do you have siblings? I have a sister living in Orange County. Used to live in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And they got retired. They moved back to, to Orange County. Okay. And because my brother-in-law, he used to work in the nuclear plant. Mm-hmm. The first job he got offered is from Orange County, the, the nuclear power plant over there. So he loved the place. He said, one day I want to come back. You know? So they lived there. My brother lives in San Diego, mm-hmm. close mm-hmm. to my parents. Mm-hmm. So, You talked about finding the shipping boxes in your basement and repurposing those materials into your art. And it sounded like maybe that that was something that you started to do during the pandemic quarantine of, of 2020. How has the global pandemic impacted your creative practice and, and how you your production, your output this year? Have you been more inspired, less inspired? Exactly. I think it's more inspired by all the incidents right now at the moment. And it used to be, I just, you just keep practicing your paintings. And, and that moment, I realized I kind of a, a fear a little bit to go out. I don't want to be attacked by people. It's, it's all the negative news. Or the horrible. News. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's like, yes. Yes. So, I kind of a more stay my studio, my home. So it's kind of a relay all the in, the news and all the material. That's what I can do. It I can just produce for this period moment. So I want to just uh, get back to the normal to to my works again, not just for the special project, also my real painting. I'm still doing, but it's kind of a. You just feel not so quiet. Sometimes you just, I don't want to do it. I just want to sit. And you keep, just listen to all the news. It's all like, ah, I want to just, when we can just go back to normal. Before Trump, was xenophobia something that you felt on a daily or weekly basis in LA and in San Diego? Or was it really something that Trump, in terms of how he handled it, his language, his words, his fear-mongering? Oh, it, it is different. It's a very different. People just joke about you, and that you, you come from with them. They say, oh, don't worry, I just, uh, I just joke. Uh, you're my friend. You know, kind of a, mm. just call you chink. And 
because that's a lot of you know happening right now, and the people try to punch you. I take a public transportation sometimes, you know, take a train. It's kind of scary. I don't even can take right now. So people have tried to punch you and hit you. Yeah, one time the guy I know he kind of a, a kind of crazy, a, per- little little off. Yeah, mental. Yeah, yeah. he come to me. He say, "Can I use your phone?" I say, "No." He look at me and it's, uh, ask me again. I say, "No, I can't." And he he just punch and not me. <laughs> he punched behind my window. The glass was just broken. Wow, broke the glass. Yeah, and he just the train stopped and he just run away. Wow, scary, really scary. Yeah, it's a lot of verbal abuse. You and just to be clear, this kind of that's a more like a Trump era. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah. So Trump apps, you know, exasperated it, stirred the stir because we know obviously America, you know, has a horrible history of racism and xenophobia and what have you. But it seemed like things were. Pretty good prior to Trump. <laughs> Getting better, right? Our first black president, things were, were feeling positive, but then he, he opened the doors to hatred again. It's just so many kind of a story that I, I collect in those stories and I put, I collect with it, I writing some of my, my daily diary into my painting. I just clutch into my paintings. It's kind of a, you can read those story back to your paintings and you send it, you still kind of see it. it's kind of your memories it's there and you know the paintings, how the paintings make. It's kind of your art journey as your part of your life. So at this moment, it's a tough, but at the same time, it's also inspire you to do some work that tell the real story. The story people may not pick up from your paintings, but they may pick something also the message, also part of his story, his life. Yeah. So, and that is relative to your current body of work? Yes. Yeah. Right. So take us through that again, because I, I, I really want our listeners to know, like in terms of your current body of work, of course, you're still developing, you're still working. It's not a finished body of work yet. But if there's one core message that you hope people can take away from the body of work that you're developing now, what is that core message? My core message is there's my story. My story also maybe people cannot pick up. People may see a something that something maybe relate to their story. And my story may be inspired to say, oh, that's the text. Oh, that's the text. Maybe, maybe pick up some date or pick up some message or maybe some text he knows it relate to his stories maybe inspire his own maybe the only just the shape uh, mm-hmm. the texture mm-hmm. or maybe the texture relate to downtown somewhere the wall the texture the dirty the locations also the texture maybe relate to oh i like to the box that i clip it i glue them to collage them. And, oh, that's the place I always order online. It's it's kind of a hybrid combine all the cultural, your personal life and the, the cultural identity into a painting. That painting is also, it's a message. Also, it's a part of my life and also inspire people's life. And also give people say, hey, it's my personal life. Also, it's your life too. You may have the same thing in your life. Yes, yes. So that's uh, my goal to maybe it's kind of a thing uh, push you away and you struggle say, hey, what is this? This is text, but I, I know that's English or maybe that's a Chinese, but it's not really I can understand. It's kind of a push you and also bring you to give us give a more detail you want to know. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how much more energy you have to put into this body of work before you feel like it's complete? I mean, do you feel like you're in the middle of the development or are you towards the end of the development of this body of work? Do you, do you see where it's going or are you still very much in the middle of it and you feel like, oh, it's going to be another year or two before it's finished? 
I have a lot of processing. Mm -hmm. I sketch a lot mm -hmm. to see the painting, to range, to deconstruct the character mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. and a sketch a lot to move around things and, and just move around, move around to, to put together and glue them together and to see how it works. And the next day, and then you go back in to see it and to review it. Sometimes it's not quite there. And you just sand it and you maybe tear off. And at the same time, once you tear off things, you see behind, it's revealing. Mm. And you see, oh, that's kind of a cool thing. And you sand it, you sand it, and you paint it again. Mm -hmm. And next day, and you see it, and you, you just sand it again. And it's a long processing until just one day, you just you know, randomly say, oh, that's, that's enough. That's enough story I, I, <laughs> I have to tell. <laughs> that's it. The end. Yeah, it's done. That's it. Yes. Yeah. It's a lot of energy. Also, my paintings, it's kind of a black and white, but mm -hmm. it's not really black and white. It's about life. It's about life and death. Mm. It's about day and night. For me especially, it's energy. It's a positive energy into mm. the mm. negative energy. Mm. You know, you mm. have to deal with your... Mm your daily lives, mm. how you transfer those bad energy into a positive. So you're not just always stay, say, hey, negative. Your daily life, like, that's a lot of things happen to you. You don't want to be so negative. You always want to be a positive. So you stay there and you, you know, just uh, put your energy, put your anger expression to your painting and come out and say, hey, that's the energy I want. That's, you know, the dirty works. <laughs> the labor intense. That's what I get. So. so when you talk about that you do a lot of sketching, I'm imagining that you're sketching in a sketchbook. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. But as you're developing ideas, are you working on a smaller scale that you then will enlarge into a bigger scale once you understand what the idea is or the concept is or what you want to do? Or are you working at a larger scale from the beginning? It, take me through the inception, right, of the idea and how you how you think it through with the sketching and the scale of that and how it builds out. Yeah, I do a lot of sketching. Sketching, I scan it and mm -hmm. put it on the computer. Mm -hmm. So it's more easy to mm -hmm. work with, mm -hmm. you know, Photoshop to rearrange, to resketch to the certain way that I like. And I produce a small pieces first to take the time to, you know, to back and forth. And then, and because the character is like a 200, 256 radical elements, the character combine each character. So you have to use those characters, how you cut, cut certain ways to revenge, to see the black and white. That's the space you play with. So you rearrange. You rearrange your life at the same time. At that moment, you make a more small piece and you put there. So, hey, that's the way I like. That's the good direction. So, I start to make a big painting. Mm, that's why okay. I make a big painting. The big painting is not really quite like the small one. Sure. Right, right, right. You're still developing. You're still adding a lot of information into the painting. It's kind of old, so hey, hey, that's a good thing so mm -hmm. I, I want to add. So mm -hmm. that's the processing of my works. Yeah, you know, it's interesting as I was listening to you talk, the the metaphor that came to mind, and this really is never I've never really thought of it this way before. It's but it's almost like a baker kneading the dough. It's like you're just kneading and kneading and kneading, and the more you need the bread, the dough, the better the final product is. And and it just feels like that's Kind experience of huh? yeah yeah the same thing they're making the dough and the same thing you think oh that's good yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's oh. a feel it's like oh, okay oh, i've worked it yeah. enough now it's time to pop it in the oven yeah yeah, yeah. exactly you you good point just like you're cooking mm. sometimes you, you don't know you just feel oh that's good yep it's time <laughs> yeah yeah uh, that's wonderful Johnny Chang, I'm so grateful to know you, my friend. I'm so grateful to have you. Thank you so much. As part of our Not Real Art community and our Not Real Art family, we love your work. We're so grateful for you and, and all of your beautiful artworks. And just to, just to call you our friend. Thank you so much, my friend. 
Hope to see you soon. If I have a I have a show in LA, so I I just send you the email so you can just. Uh, I still like to people to see in person to see my work. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, I I would love to come for a studio visit if I could at some point, and uh, yeah, 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 that'll be wonderful. I'll I'll follow up with you on that, but. For our listeners' sake, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you online? Instagram. Instagram. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Yeah. What's your handle on Instagram? I have a four four account. Oh, okay. (laughs) I'll tell you what. We'll put it in the blog post so they'll they'll, they'll be able to find you. Because I have a three project. Mm -hmm. I do photographer and do some 3D works and and paintings. Uh, sometimes I come by. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I just do one, you know, just straight paintings. Sometimes do three D. The three mm-hmm. D paintings inspired by my flat work, and my paintings, and sometimes mm-hmm. my photos inspire. So I kind of like give us some. Some people like to photo. People like to three D. Some people like to like paintings. Yeah, that's good that you segment them out so that people, people know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and also kind of a, just inspire each other. It's all related mm-hmm. to the all the text of calligraphy and mm-hmm. kind mm-hmm. of the texture, the city information, yeah. all the people, humanities. <laughs> well, I really do look forward to seeing your work in person because I I already can tell that it's the kind of work that it's very hard to appreciate online. It is so strong, but there's so much depth to it and so much texture yes, to yes, it that. Yes the online experience, it's hard to see. It's hard to fully appreciate the, yeah. the depth and the texture. Yes, yes. And I think that people, it's more and more online. But I, I love in person to see the people, you know, yes. you give them some texture, the feel. Yes. But Good. we'll, well see. Soon. All my galleries close. And yeah. I hope they can come back to normal so we can see in person and the talk. Even online, it's kind of a weird to talk to each other so close, but at the same time, so far, kind of a feeling, you know what I mean? It, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I'm so grateful we can do this, right? I mean, yeah, for people who are yeah. listening, I mean, we're, we're, we're not on Zoom, but it's like a Zoom. I can see you. We have a video yeah, conference yeah, yeah. happening. We're not recording the video, though, but it's wonderful, but it's not the same. It's one dimensional still. It's still yeah. one dimensional. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, the technology. Mm. <laughs> so a friend of mine said it best, said uh, mm. today's technology has brought people far apart, closer together, and people close, farther apart. Exactly. Yeah. Even people who sit next to you, they just stay on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> they just text you. Yeah. It's kind of a fun. You know, that's yeah. the way we're living right now. A friend of mine was telling me his daughter... I guess she was 10 or 10 or 11 or something. They had a birthday party and none of the kids were really talking. They were kind of all on their phones. And what he would come to learn is that they were all texting each other. They were all at the same party, okay? <laughs> all sitting, all sitting around the same table or whatever. But rather than talking, they were texting each other. And this is the culture, you know, That's of it. it's bizarre. Are we going to losing the, the scale of communication we don't even i think you're right that's a problem people don't want to talk anymore they rather just text you yes yes well we're losing our humanity and and when you lose your humanity it's easy to hate each other and discriminate or absolutely yes this is the problem technology should serve the human race and it optimize our humanity not to de-emphasize our humanity you know exactly yeah, weird, weird stuff. But we are here to get people people together. That's right. I used to do a lot of uh, street art, mm-hmm. a chalk festival in Pasadena. Oh yeah, for many years. And this year, so we can do it. But mm-hmm. we we just uh, project the video about back to twenty thirty years about uh, the festival. People get together, five hundred artists. You know, they work together. Anything. It's the time that we're missing. So people really see your works by hand. How amazing is that? You don't even have to have any language. You just know the visual language inspire you, just touching you. At the moment, you just say, oh, wow. Yeah. That's it. Well, I look forward to getting back to that, my friend. And we will. Yes. And we will. Positive. Always. (laughs) 
John Chang, thank you so much, my friend, for your time tonight and your generosity. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on being our 2021 grant recipient. We so appreciate you. And just thank you for all you do. It's my honor. I'm looking forward to see you soon. Me as well. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review, and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at NotRealArtWorld.